Without further words, he drew from his belt a sharp pointed knife and began the painful process of removing one by one the embedded spines from the boy's right hand before they should begin to fester. He finished this bit of rough and ready surgery by washing out each deep puncture with stinging salt water. When he had entirely finished, Jimmy Tom carefully tucked away the sponge in a pocket fastened to the side of the canoe and, slipping the wide-mouthed bag again over his neck, stood on the thwart ready for another dive. Try to remember with your thick head, said his grandfather severely, all that I have told you, and if I signal you to come back, you come. The boy nodded briefly took several deep breaths, and again shot down through the water, directing his course toward another part of the reef, where the white sand was dotted with shells, all hyaline or clouded with exquisite colors. As he reached the bottom, the boy's swift, supple fingers searched among crystal white, purple and rose and gold olivillas, docinias, and telinas, which, in spite of their beauty, had no special value. Just as he was about to return to the surface empty-handed, his eye caught the gleam of several spires of the rare sky-white coral showing among the wavy waterweed. A hasty look aloft showed no si signal of danger from his sentinel, and he still had nearly three minutes before water would exact her toll of oxygen from him. A swift stroke brought him to the edge of the weed bed. Just as he was about to reach for the coral, his trained eye caught sight of a gleaming white, beautifully shaped shell, nearly as large as the palm of his hand. With a quick motion, he reached under the wavering leaves and, even as his fingers closed on its corrugated surface, realized that he had found at last a perfect specimen of the royal Wentel trap, among the rarest and most beautiful of shells. In the collections of the world, there are perhaps not six perfect specimens, and sponge divers and shell gatherers along a thousand lonely coasts are ever on the lookout for this treasure of the sea. The pure white rounded whorls of this one were set off with wide frilled varices, each ending in a point above, the whole forming a perfect crown of snow and crystal indescribably airy and beautiful. The sight and feeling of this treasure put every thought out of Jimmy Tom's mind, save to reach the surface with it as soon as possible. The coral could wait. For that shell, any one of the collectors who called at Carib Island would gladly pay him twice the hundred dollars he needed. Suddenly, even as he turned toward the surface from a deep crevice in the coral close to his side, shot a fierce and hideous head like that of some monstrous snake, ridged with a fin with, which showed like a crest. Before the boy could move, two long jaws, filled with curved teeth, snapped shut on his right hand and wrist, and he realized with a dreadful pang of fear and pain that had been gripped by one of the great conger eels which lurk in the crevices of the reef. Eight feet in length and as large around as a man's leg, they are among the most fearsome of all the sea folk which a diver must brave. For a second, Jimmy Tom tugged with all his strength, but no result except that the greenish-gray body retreated deeper into its cave. Then it was that he remembered what his grandfather had told him, was the only way to escape from the deadly jaws of a conger eel. Relaxing every muscle, he allowed his hand to lie limp in the great fish's teeth. Sooner or later, if he kept quiet, the monster would open its jaws for a better grip. As the cold, deadly eyes stared implac implacably into his, the beating of his laboring heart sounded in his ears like a drum of doom. If so be that the fierce fish did not relax his grip within the next thirty seconds, the boy knew that his life would go out of him in a long stream of silvery air bubbles. By a tremendous effort of will, he strove against the almost irresistible impulse to do something, to pull, to struggle, to slash with his knife at the horrid head. 
Yet, clenching his teeth grimly, he set himself so that hardest of all tasks to wait and wait. His eyes, hot and dim with suffused blood, fell on the crown shell which he held in his free hand, that shell which was to win for him the sloop, and suddenly through the luminous gleaming water he seemed to see his cabin on far away Carib Island and his mother's face looking into his. As the vision faded, he felt a slight shifting and loosening of the grim jaws, with the last effort of his will dimming before the flood of unconsciousness creeping up to his brain, he allowed his body to float limp, and he relaxed every straining muscle. Even as he did so, the great jaws gaped apart for an instant, and the fierce head thrust itself toward him for a fresh grip. Fighting back the waves of blackness which swept across his eyes, by a quick turn and wrench, he freed his imprisoned hand and, with a tremendous scissors kick of his powerful legs, shot away just as the curved teeth struck, empty together. Up and up and up he sped, swimming as he had never swum before, yet seeming to himself, under the desperate urge of his tortured lungs, to move slow as the hour hand of a clock. The sunlit surface seemed to move away and away and recede to an immeasurable distance, just as he felt despairingly that he could no longer resist the uncontrollable desire of his anguished lungs to act. Even if they drew in the waters of death, his head shot above the surface. There was a sudden roaring in his ears as the strong arms of Jim Tom pulled him into the canoe. Too weak to speak or move, he lay experiencing the utter happiness there is in breathing, which only the half-drowned may know. All the rest of that day, the boy lay in the shade of the towering coral wall, while old Jim Tom dressed his gashed and pierced hand. As the calm weather still held, the old man decided to spend the night in the canoe just outside the sheer wall of the reef where the water stretched away to unknown depths. Toward evening, the boy's strength came back, and after eating and drinking ravenously, he showed but little effect of the strain to which he had been subjected. When the moon rises, said his grandfather at length, we will start for home. The boy shook his head obstinately. Tomorrow, as soon as it is light... He said, I dive again to bring up such white coral as has not been seen on Carib Island in my day. In your day, exclaimed old Jim Tom, much incest, in your minute, for that is all you have lived. Never has any man made a better haul than you. Be satisfied, the reef is not fortunate for the greedy. My silk sponge was won from the jaws of a shark. And my shell from the conger eel, returned the boy doggedly. I ask no favors of the reef. The old man glanced around apprehensively, while the water seemed to chuckle as it lapped against the coral. It is not lucky to talk that way, he said softly. Sleep now, he went on after a pause. When morning comes, perhaps there will be a better spirit in you, and we will go home. A little later, while the great moon climbed the sky and the golden sea stretched away unbroken, the two slept. Hours later, Jim Tom awoke with a start. Through his sleep had penetrated the sharp, sinister scent of musk, and even before he opened his eyes, he felt some hostile living presence near him. As he raised his head above the side of the canoe, the still surface of the sea beyond was all a writhe with what seemed a mass of white sea snakes. Suddenly, from out of the livid tangle, shot toward the boat, two thirty-foot tentacles, larger around than a man's body, tapering to a point and covered with round sucking discs, armed with claws of black horn, sharp and curved as those of a tiger, the great white squid 
the devil fish of unknown depths, which hardly once or twice in a generation comes to the surface, was before him. For a moment the old man stared in horror at the twisting, fatal tentacles. Then with a hoarse cry he roused Jimmy Tom, who started up, grasping the keen machete which always lay in a sheath at the bottom of the canoe. Even as he unsheathed the curved blade, one of the vast, pale streamers reached the canoe, flowed over its side, and licked around the waist of the old man. On the instant, red stains showed through his thin shirt, where the armed discs sank deep into his flesh as the horrid arm dragged his helpless body toward the water. Just in time, the boy swung the machete over his head and severed the crunching streamer, and then, with a return stroke, cut through another that licked out toward him across the boat. As he turned, the old man stretched his arm out toward the sea with a gasp of horror. Up through the water came a vast, cylindrical shape of livid flesh, many times the size of the canoe from which long tentacles radiated like a wheel, and the middle of the shapeless mass was set a head of horror with a vast parrot-like beak with gnashed over a mouth like a cavern, which gnashed over a mouth like a cavern. On another side of the demon jaws glared two lidless eyes, each larger than a barrel, rimmed around with white, of an inky, unfathomable black, they stared at the boat with a malign- malignancy which no earthborn creature could equal or endure. Unable to sustain that appalling glare, both the caribs thrust their arms before their faces, expecting every second to feel the deadly touch of the armed tentacles. It was the boy who recovered himself first. Setting his teeth grimly, he suddenly raised his head to face again this demon of the lowest depths. As his exclamation, at his exclamation of surprise, the old man forced himself to look up. The water stretched before them, empty and unbroken. Only the scent of musk and grisly fragments of the death-pale tentacles in the bottom of the canoe were there to prove that the monster had not been a ghastly dream of the night. Without a word, Jimmy Tom shipped the outriggers and, gripping his paddle, took his place at the bow. All the rest of that night and far into the next day they paddled until at last Carib Island loomed up on the horizon. From the sail of the Wentel Trap and the silk sponge, Jimmy Tom bought not only his sloop and a new canoe for Jim Tom, but still had the hundred hundred of dollars which makes a man rich on Carib Island. Yet, in spite of his fortune he brought back from the reef, he has never returned to it again. When urged by friends or collectors, he only shakes his head and says, oracularly, enough is plenty. And that's the end of the story.